Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach, when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun, in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook, and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Riding Shotgun with Charlie. Today we're actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and my guest on the program today is none other than the radio personality, is that what you are? Sure, radio personality, sounds, author. He used to write for, or still writes for, the United States Concealed Carry Association magazine. 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. He's got two books out, Lessons from Armed America with Kathy Jackson, and Lessons from Unarmed America with Rob Pincus. And this is my guest today. This is none other than Mark Walters. Dude, it is a pleasure. Pleasure to have you. It is a pleasure. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be on. See, I say have you because I'm a radio host, so I'm always used to the guest being <laughs> on, you know? I know, right? It's, it's great to be the guest on someone else's show. Oh, yeah. this is cool. Yeah, so let's have some fun. Let's do it, man. Here's what I want to talk about. I just want to talk. We'll talk gun stuff. We can talk how you got started on this, uh, how long you've been shooting, how you got into radio. I know you've had a lot of careers before you got into radio and before you started doing the Armed American Radio program. One major one. That was most of my most of my career was spent trucking. Prior to uh, people say trucking, you know, how'd you how do you go from trucking to radio? Yeah, I know you got to talk clean. Um, but it was when I got out of college. I'll date myself. I got out of college in 1984, and I went to work for overnight transportation company. So it was based out of Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. My parents' neighbor in Richmond was a. He's a vice president of operations for overnight transportation company. Oh, cool. And they were playing cards one night, and I was about two months from graduating, and he said, you want a job when you get out, when you get out of college, boy? <laughs> I said, well, sure, I'm looking for one. Yeah, what's what's the choice? Well, you know, about two months later, I found myself in training in York, Pennsylvania, that's with that's a right. cheap $25, you know, cardboard company issue briefcase and an off-the-rack suit. <laughs> I was uh, transferred to York, PA. Where I went to work selling less than truckload services for overnight transportation, and I did that for a number of years, and then eventually started my own brokerage company down in uh, Tampa, Florida. Cool. I figured I could teach people how to how to deal with people like me, and I could save them some money <laughs> because right. I didn't always have their best interest at heart. I had my company's best interest at heart, so I figured, you know, I could make I could teach people how to save some money mm -hmm. and make some money from them by saving them money. And that idea took off. The next thing I know, I had a pretty successful truckload brokerage business. Wow! As an agency, and um, that's that was the trucking career, you know. And then, how does that go to guns? Good question. How does that go to guns? <laughs> <laughs> I get asked that a lot. It's a, it is a fascinating story, it really is. But I, I was. Uh, it's chapter one in my book. I had a uh, unfortunate run-in in Tampa, Florida, on my way to work back in 2002. My daughter, she was two weeks old, and it kind of, you know, kids change your outlook on things, you know? Yeah, they do. And I had, you know, she didn't come with a manual, and all I knew was I felt this responsibility that I had to protect this little girl. And I had always carried a gun for a number of years, ever since I was making sales calls in the trucking business in some bad areas of town. I began carrying a gun, I, you know, probably illegally. I didn't have a permit for it when I first bought the gun. I wrote it in my pocket and mm -hmm. made me feel good, and that was all I cared about. And I, in Tampa, I got my concealed carry permit, started doing some training, significant amounts of training. And I found myself on my way to work, the, um, I think the unintended victim of a potential carjacking, when two guys in front of me targeted a vehicle, had a traffic light off my front left bumper, mm -hmm. couldn't get into that vehicle, turned their attention towards me, and I was armed that morning, had a Glock 36 with me, and I leveled it over the steering wheel. And, pointed it at both of them as they turned their attention towards me and in a matter of seconds that encounter ended and I went home safe and my daughter has her father and my son would subsequently be born and that later became a column for Concealed Carry Magazine. Oh wow, that's cool. And that's how that's how all that happened. I got a 3x5 um, index card in the mail from Tim Schmidt. 
Schmidt soliciting the first 500 subscribers to Concealed Carry Magazine. Yeah. And if I was one of the first 500 subscribers, I would get the, I would win the little bullet 45 caliber keychain. Oh, that's cool. And the grand prize winner in the 500 of the first 500 would win a new gun. Well, I didn't win the new gun, but I did win the 45 caliber bullet <laughs> keychain, yeah. which was later taken away from me at Tampa International Airport by TSA, <laughs> by the way. And uh, I w later we found out that I would be member number 32. Oh my gosh. So I've been, I've been a subscriber of Concealed Carry Magazine for a number of years, and when I first got the first few issues of the magazine, I thought, wow, this is great. This should be my idea. Mm. But it wasn't. <laughs> And I contacted Tim because I knew I could tell by the articles that he needed someone. He needed some help with writers, and I figured, hey, I, you know, I've got a great story to tell, right? And I thought it would work. And I contacted Tim, and I wrote the story that I just told you about. He loved it, and it became my first column in Concealed Carry Magazine. It was titled "The Importance of Carrying Your Gun 100% of the Time," mm. and it is now in the uh, best of archives of the magazine. And I've been writing the column uh, ever since That's and it, it started as the, the column was the ordinary guy and it's now one to the head we, we renamed it one we titled it one to the head liberals hate that because <laughs> they don't understand that it's metaphorically speaking mm -hmm. when I say one to the head we're trying to get you to think Right. And all the liberals yeah, say, oh, he's talking about shooting people in the head. You know, that's no, just kind of the way liberals it's, think. It's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely one to think about because, you know, when we read stories like yours or stories like Lee's story, right. we, we hear these things and that's when, when a lot of us start to say, oh my gosh, this could have been me. I could have not been ha had a gun on me that day. I could have been, you know, 30 you know, seconds delay that's the whole in one object. direction. That's the whole object. That's what we want to do. That's the, the, the passion of, of saying to someone, we want you to learn from this experience. Mm -hmm. Um writing the column over the years got me a lot of attention from people who I, I started writing stories of people who had you know who were victims I was hearing from people all the time who were people of who were victims of crime like I was yeah. I, you know I wasn't really a victim of a crime I think I stopped it before it became a crime and that's what it's all about is to go it home is. in one piece it's total prevention so I started writing I started writing these stories of people and they they really hit home one of them was my cousin who was abducted at gunpoint Lucky wow. to be alive, and and others. And, you know Lee's story you, you, that you reference is in the book. It's in your second book. Yeah, it's in the second book with Rob Pinkus. So it, you know, we decided let, let's make this a lesson. Let's teach people. Mm -hmm. Let's let's inform people that you know, real life. It, it, you're, there's evil in real life, and it may confront you. So if it does, how can you be prepared for it? So that's the whole premise of the book, the radio show, the magazine column. Politically, it's it's taken a little bit of a turn, particularly this year because of the politics. Mm. You know, we've got terrible enemies of freedom that are trying to take away our rights. Absolutely. And I've become a, a very vocal and uh, in many circles trusted mouthpiece because I have the microphone. Right. The show has grown. It's on hundreds of cities around the country. That's and awesome. as a result, a lot of people turn to you for advice and assistance, and they they want to know, hey, thank you for being a voice that you you feel like I feel say the things that I think about and that really matters and it's home when I get those emails. Oh, it, abs it absolutely does. It absolutely does. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've been, <laughs> I've been stewing about this knowing, uh, knowing I'm, or hoping that I was going to be able to, to sit in the car with you. There's something that I wanted to change that the, the left has totally changed it and something that I think we should really change to what they really want. They used to talk about having gun control right. and they've gone from gun control to other than what? Oh, gun safety. Gun safety. Sure. And it's always like, well, we need gun safety because people shouldn't have, you know, we want people to be safe with guns. But what they really want, and this is a phrase that I, if anyone ever used it, it came from me, mm -hmm. it's gun abstinence is really what well, they Well, you know, I like that. That's a great term. I might steal that for the I radio th show. I, I can do would. that and, and get away with it. And totally. <laughs> if you said it, you know, well, here it's on tape, I guess it's not. So no, I, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's true. You it know, is what, gun abstinence because what we do, you know, when our kids are teenagers, we teach them that we want them to abstain from having, sure, having sex, of course. But we know it's not entirely 100% possible, so we teach them how to be safe and teach right. them about all the whatever other alternatives and blah blah blah. So it's not it's not gun safety they want because, like you say all the time, they, there's no every town for gun safety gun class. Well, I'm still looking for their classes. Yeah. I can't find it. I've called them, I've emailed them, I've twittered and tweeted them. I can't get a response from them. Yep. But I'm glad you brought that up because what they've done is, and this is what's so important, they've changed, and this is why the media is so dangerous. And we could talk about the media all day long. But the media is really the most dangerous entity we face in America today. It's not Obama. It's not Hillary Clinton. It's not even Michael Bloomberg. 
it's the mainstream media because it's the mainstream media that's directing this narrative and it's the mainstream media that's giving a pass to the people, the enemies of our freedoms, that do exactly what you just said. They're allowing them to change the language. And we know it, you know, Katie Couric's latest film came out. Every once in a while, the lefties will, the progressive anti-gun American, un-Americans, uh, the socialist formerly known as the Democrat Party, who is now pushing to, to uh, disarm all of us. Every once in a while, they'll slip up. One of their own will make a mistake. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Katie Couric did it on an interview about her latest movie, Under the Gun, that was now widely discredited because of her selective editing, her lies, if you will. Mm -hmm. And as a result, she said, well, we don't like to. She was on the uh, John Stewart, I think. And they were sitting there drinking beer on TV. On nice. the Daily Show or whatever show he does. I don't watch that lefty stuff. Right. And she said, well, we like to call it gun safety. We don't like to say gun control. Because gun control sounds so... And then she stopped herself. Mm -hmm. Sounds so ah, 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 <laughs> Sounds so good. You see, now you know Bloomberg and some of the other guys are out there watching that going, oh, shut up, Katie. Right. You know, God dang, you're giving away all our secrets. That happens from time to time. Obama himself has done it many times. Yeah. yeah. When he's stepped up to the podium and said, you know, anybody who opposes, in fact, I run it on one of the rejoiners coming back on my show, you hear Obama in a quote, you know, those who oppose any, sample, any measures of gun control or gun safety, he catches himself. Mm -hmm. and the bottom line is real gun safety is teaching your kids. Yeah, oh, you know, absolutely. Finger you off the trigger. Respect, you know, all for, yeah, it's teaching true safety measures. Absolutely. You're a certified instructor. I'm a certified instructor. We teach and talk about real gun safety. Absolutely. Gun safety to the anti-gun left is just controlling you and taking away your rights. So. Totally. I've been, uh, my kids were super young. My, my, I don't want to say my story is not the same as yours, but it's not necessarily very different either. I didn't think about gun stuff until, uh, honestly, until September 11th. I was teaching in a school, and after... After September 11th, they said if anyone comes in the building that's not supposed to be there, you are gonna hide, we're gonna get on the intercom and say the eagle has landed and we hide under the desks. And I'm like, well, that's kind of crazy. If all the teachers on the first floor had a gun, they could shoot the bad guy, right. and the teachers on the second floor could keep on teaching. And they all looked at me and thought I was crazy. So that's what I'm. I what say, state are you in? Uh, Massachusetts. Okay, yeah, the Commonwealth. Yeah. yeah okay. I, my, my line. My line when I'll, I teach I'll, them. I'll withhold my comments. <laughs> my I will line, say it's very sad that the seat. That, oh yeah, that, totally. that the location of our, the founding of our nation, is so far off base. Oh my gosh, it, it's really sad. I like, told yeah, people, I, when I do classes and I tell people Massachusetts gun laws, I say my line during this section is, "Welcome to the Commonwealth." <laughs> <laughs> so people see, I'd like my fa my grandfather's shotgun that was given to me when he right. died is illegal for me to have. Yep. Yeah. You got to be kidding me. No, not at all. But well, you know, people people are coming to a point now that. And I, I use the election. America's not going to be healed on November 9th. The country will be farther apart the day after the election than it was the day of the election and the day before the election, sadly. I don't think half of America will accept the outcome. Yeah. This nation is so fractured right now. And I've often said over the years, and I, I didn't really know how it would manifest itself, but I'm beginning to see it come to fruition now. But I've often said that in the very near future, if the progressive left has their way, that good, decent, law-abiding Americans are going to find that they're going to have to make very difficult decisions that oh, they yeah. never thought they would have to make in their lifetimes. And people say, oh, what are you talking about? You're Now you're talking subversive. Well, no, that's just a liberal lefty not understanding because they can't think they feel. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, what, I'm, what I'm referring to is that good people are going to have to decide does this law, am I going, you know, do I have to turn my gun in? Am I going to have to register this firearm? At what point in time is it is it enough? What human being has the moral authority to tell me that right. I no longer have a right to defend my family and what tool I choose to use? And I put it in this context. Mm -hmm. Firearms that are legal today, this you know, good friend of mine, Alan Corwin, mentioned this on the show, and it really gave me something to think about, and I hope you know your viewers and my listeners think about it as well. How can someone, how can some man or woman in this case, make something that you own today that is perfectly legal, illegal tomorrow. Now you found that out in Massachusetts, California is getting ready to find that out. Where does that moral authority come from? And I would submit to you that it doesn't come from them and that they can't. So these are the decisions Americans are going to be faced with. Very tough decisions that good, decent, law-abiding Americans never thought they'd be forced to make. Yeah, it's 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 completely ridiculous. The uh, the gun safety stuff with kids. Here's yeah. what I did with my kids. I taught my and I tell this in my class. I've had people come up to me and say, "Hey, I've got young kids. How do, what do you do with kids? How do you handle this?" I say, "Here's what I did with my kids. I did Nerf gun safety." Uh -huh. And be 
safer than Nerf gun. And I told my son, if your sister's not in a gunfight, you can't shoot her. And if you're, you know, your mother's not in a gunfight, you can't shoot her. But you're well, you starting a gunfight. Take the shoot. curiosity away from kids. Oh, you know, I, I grew up watching the the cartoons. You know, people dropping, you know, the roadrunner dropping <laughs> anvils on people's heads. And, <laughs> right. You know. Or the Stooges. <laughs> Watch you know, what's his name? Elmer Fudd with the shotgun and blowing yep. off, you know, blowing you know, Bugs, the Bunny. Bugs Bunny's head off. And it, oh, what is it? What happens? His head doesn't get blown off. He turns into a big cloud of cordite dust, you know. Yeah. And that's not real life. And, and, you know, we came out just fine. And after the cartoon was over, I got on my bike without a helmet, and I, you know, had a dirt clod fight with my neighbor kids, and we hopped over, you know, the big holes that were soon going to be the basements of the construction site yep, of the house. Next absolutely. Week. And we all survived, and we did just fine. But it's curiosity, is is what we have to take away from kids. All curious, all kids are curious about guns. So when we strip the curiosity from guns, they're not fascinated if they it's, see them. Absolutely. And that's how we keep them safe. Yep, absolutely. It's not a big deal that uh, that I'm a gun owner and I'm a gun instructor and I carry a gun and carry knives and it's you know it's it's just something my kids have learned that dad does and something he's into and when we go to the range you know they have a good time doing it they have a, they have a fun time and then honestly we go out for ice cream afterwards for sure or, or now that they're older we go out for a bite to eat i openly carry my guns when i take my kids to dairy queen and nobody says a thing <laughs> i live in a free state i'm like yeah. yeah unlike me i know what would happen if if you went up to a dairy queen with an open firearm and message uh, I, people would freak out i'm sure i'm sure somebody would scream and shout and, be, and my what i tell people is if, if anyone sees that i'm carrying and they say oh my god he's got a gun i'm gonna put my hand to my hip and start looking around and say where who boom <laughs> they're gonna be like you do i'm like well, of course I have a gun. Give me a break. Yeah, it's it's completely ridiculous. And and we're we're in, especially in Massachusetts when you know this is something we've talked about before. Also, is when when you see somebody open carrying, particularly where we're in my part of the country, you think the guy's either a cop. Sure, we talked about that last night. Yeah, or he's like an FBI agent. Nobody or something. really looks at it. Look, this is all media driven stuff. Okay, real people. And you know, I fly a lot, so I, you look down as you're flying. Mm-hmm look at the country flying beneath you as you're flying over the top of it and you realize you know is that farmer watching Fox News you know (laughs) is his head in the media all day is he worried about gay and lesbian transgender no he's not not. this is all media driven stuff and real people who don't do this stuff and don't don't follow the news all day every day really aren't thinking about those things the media is telling people what to think and they're driving this narrative and you know look if, if you were to parachute into this country as an alien you know you would never you would never re, you would never recognize like if I could wake up my grandfather who passed away in 1987 God bless him if I could wake him up he wouldn't recognize the country no not at all it's a, based on what you saw in the news but guess what we're all the same mm-hmm. his grandkids are all the same you know, we'd go out and grill chicken wings just like we always did. Yeah. And if as long as you're not watching the news, you don't really realize all of the crap that's going on out there. Oh, right. So I often say, get your head out of your media and quit watching this stuff all the time. There's plenty of time to watch it. I'm old enough to remember watching Walter Cronkite at 6.30 at night. Mm-hmm. You know, later becoming Dan Rather biased. Remember that? Right. But we did just fine. We went to school. We did what we did. We had those dirt cloud fights. We even had BB gun fights, you know, without helmets <laughs> and goggles. And we all survived. Nobody shot their eye out. Nobody shot your it eye It was out. probably wasn't a really good idea, and I kind of wonder why the parents let that happen. But as a parent <laughs> myself, I probably wouldn't let my kids be shooting baby guns at each other. Right. But the fact of the matter is life was different. But at 6.30 after dinner, we all watched the news for a half news. hour. Yeah. We got our dose of news, and we went ahead and did what we did, and life was great. And here with a 24-hour news cycle, it's doing tremendous damage to the psyche of the country, particularly because in today's day and age, it's pushing a political agenda, and that's very, very dangerous. It is. I, I got to tell you, I'm super proud of my son because he picks up on, on I, I don't have cable TV, but he picks up on, Good on all this social media stuff, and uh, he, you know, he, he certainly spent time making fun of Bernie Sanders. So it's, <laughs> it's good to hear my son saying, you know, Bernie Sanders doesn't want us to have guns, or Hillary Clinton doesn't want us to have guns. Right. And, and she's surrounded by people who carry guns all the time. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly how it is. But well, that's the irony. People, I think people are seeing that. You know, I hate to say I, I can't put. I say I think people are seeing that because I truly think I have a lot of people tell me that they see that. And as a result of that, I think that hypocrisy is exposed. It's not just something that I, you know, say, oh hey, like a pundit on TV. You know, I think you know a, a, Americans feel this way. I don't know what all Americans feel. You know, nor does the girl on Fox News or the CNN or whatever. They don't right. know. They don't know what what Americans think. And this is the punditry that I think is just driving the 
driving the country crazy right now. Yeah, it's, you know, when you live in a big city it's and you live in the country, it's it's two totally different worlds. Yeah. It completely is. I grew up in the Midwest in, in about an hour south of Chicago, and I, I tell everyone I'm the boy from Illinois, and I grew up in the cornfields. Not not entirely a stretch of, uh, of reality, but I just, myself, I wanted to get out of the Midwest, because I'm like, there's a whole other world of stuff out there. And then when you talk to people that live in the big city, they... Uh, when I, when I went to college in Boston, I didn't go past where Boston University was. Because I'm like, dude, that's like Western Mass, mm -hmm. even, though it's, even though it's just past the Back Bay. And you go to the next area, and you find out that the people that live in the cities don't get out of the cities. Right. And they get their head wrapped up in everything. You know, they get their head wrapped in the media, and people think that all gun owners are whatever, redneck hillbillies with bibbo. Well, that's, again, that's that's the media-driven narrative. That's that's what the media is telling people. And that's because they're pushing that political agenda. That's why they're driving that narrative. And you, you, you see the stupidest thing coming from people who have no idea what they're talking about. And I often, I use funny stuff. You, you know, you watch whatever. I can't stand the morning news programs. I just can't stand them anymore. Oh, my gosh. You know, you flip on, I don't know, pick any news channel. Well, I'll just say Fox News because I'll watch that more than anything else. But here you got some 28-year-old girl telling me what America thinks. And I, I wonder how that happened. How does she know what America thinks? <laughs> right. How does she know more than I do? I've, I've been around twice as long as she has. Exactly. Almost. Not quite. Almost. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is I know more than she does. I've seen more than she does. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, and I, you, know, you know, you just say, how does this, these people give themselves titles. They get on news programs. And, you know, I have, you know, I think what we got to do. There are, there are four words that don't belong together. Pairs. Number one, career politician, right? <laughs> career right. and politician don't belong in the same sentence, do they? Mm. Thanks, New York, for you know, 40 years of Chuck Schumer. That's what I'm talking oh about. Gosh. Because they, they corrupt. Power corrupts. And it was never, the founders never designed our republic to be that way. They, it was designed to come in, do the work of the people, and go home. And head out. Go back to your farms, go back to your businesses, and do what you do. The other two words that don't belong together are news personalities. Right? And <laughs> right. I, th I think we could eliminate a lot of the bias in the news, and I say this sarcastically, but I kind of long for the day it would happen, is every six months rotate these clowns out so they don't become news personalities. They don't become stars and begin believing their own hype, and they're oh all gosh. more worried about what stories they're doing and who they're interviewing and talking yep. amongst themselves. They're in this little clique. Throw the bombs out, and every six months rotate, and then guess what's going to happen? We'll start getting news. We'll start mm. getting news stories, you know. Yep. I had a friend of mine that uh, went to Europe a few years ago, and he said it was refreshing to sit and watch a news story that was about four the minutes. News. Yeah, it was about four minutes long because they went into depth about stuff instead of just flashing headlines and uh, you know getting getting people's attention. And that's it. Yeah, it's pretty sad. It is. So where are we going? We're going to the Minnesota State Fair, right? We now, are right? going to the Minnesota State Fair, and uh, every place that Lee and his wife have taken me never looks familiar and I've only been in town for a couple days so I'm following my trusty Steve Jobs GPS here and uh, good luck with that I know right <laughs> <laughs> now I've been this is the fifth year I've been broadcasting the show from the fair and it's an awful lot of fun and of course I knew we were going to the fair but it's it, it, people who have never been here have you ever been to this fair? I have never been to this fair. so will we this be when you walk in with me the first time you've walked in it, yes absolutely. Okay, it's, it's incredible this is not the, uh, this is not the carny. This is not the you know right. set up in the dirt pile that's the fairgrounds <laughs> once a year right. where you're from. This is the real deal. This is hundreds of thousands of people, and it, it is. I think it becomes the world's largest eatery. You guys, have, I remember hearing you guys talk about that last time, and I know you talked about it this past week too. Yeah, because everything's all the foods on a stick. Everything. We used to do the gun on a stick giveaway last year for the show, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool, man. Cool, cool, cool. So let me ask you this. Uh, how did you get into writing the book with Kathy Jackson? Kathy Jackson was my editor at the time at Concealed Carry Magazine Okay. years ago. In fact, she was the first editor of Concealed Carry Magazine, I think, that Tim Schmidt hired after the company began to take off. Very cool. And Kathy and I, she loved, she loved me writing the stories mm -hmm. about real people and real people's lives. And I enjoyed writing those stories. They were difficult to write because I would do interviews with people about the single worst part of their life, the oh single my worst thing that has ever happened to this human uh, being. Yeah, I had to write stories about one of them in particular was uh, Jorick Landry, and 
the story that I wrote because I needed the money. It was to this day, I've never had a more devastating conversation. I had tears in my eyes by the time the conversation was over wow. about what would happen to this man and his family. And it wound up, um, I wrote it originally for the magazine. Mm -hmm. Then we converted it to a book chapter. And then Kathy came in behind me and we did something that had never been done before. Other people had written stories. These stories of self-defense are not new. Oh, no, not uh, at you all. Know, Robert Waters had a wonderful book called The Best Defense, I think it was what it was. A number of years ago, this guy out of Florida um, it was a really good, really good book about stories of he also had, who used guns. Did he also write Thank God I Had a Gun? He did. He wrote both of them, yeah. Okay. He wrote both. So what we did was we did the stories of self-defense and then put the education behind it. That's awesome. It, let's teach people. So what happened is the toughest job was not mine writing the story. That's easy. I can write, can write the story. Mm -hmm. The tough part was Kathy and then later Rob coming in behind those stories and analyzing the right. worst moment of someone's life in a way that others could learn from it mm -hmm. and educate themselves from it. And that was not easy to do. I won't name any names, but we've had uh, a couple people come back and request that chapters be pulled because they didn't like the analysis mm, of what really? happened yeah. yeah wow it's hard to do so both Kathy and Rob and I think that happened with Rob not with Kathy but yeah it is it's not easy to do you know Monday morning quarterbacking the worst moment of some most worst moments of someone's life is very difficult oh my gosh I can imagine yeah the, I think the books are super educational in that you know like you said you've got a chapter of the story and a chapter of the things that went well and the things that might have been able to be different right and you, there's no way to know. Oh yeah, it's all. Uh, I was rereading, um, rereading your first book, and I was rereading uh, Lee's story also. And and everything that Rob says in the second book is just, well, this could have happened, and this could have happened, or this could have happened, but we never know. We never know. You know, it's very reminiscent. I, I had Susanna Hupp is a very close friend of mine, and, and a and a hero of mine. Of course, Susanna being the survivor of the uh, one of the Luby's survivors Cafe. of Luby's Cafeteria. In 1992, down in Colleen, Texas, she was there having a leisurely lunch with her mother and father and a mm -hmm. friend of hers when George Hennard, the lunatic psychopath murderer, rammed his pickup truck into the glass wall, got out, and systematically shot and killed 23 people, her parents included, right in front of her face in cold blood. Right. She watched her parents killed. Her and five other people had their lawfully carried guns in their cars or trucks outside. And that's what law-abiding people do. They didn't bring the gun into the restaurant because it was against Texas law at the time. Mm -hmm. She later went on to become a Texas state legislator and famously confronted Chuck Schumer and the rest of a bunch oh, of yeah. un-American Democrat gun grabbers, socialists, formerly known as the Democrats, on a Senate panel and reminded them that the Second Amendment isn't about deer hunting or duck hunting. It's so all of us, and she pointed to the gallery, can protect and defend ourselves from all of you. Mm -hmm. And I did a Fox News show, the Stossel show with her. I sat on a panel with her and Nikki Gosar. Wow. And John Stossel asked her if you had had a gun that day in the Lubies, would it have changed things? And Susanna said, going to what you and I were just talking about, we never know. She said, I don't know. I don't know, but I know it would have changed the odds. Absolutely. And that's that's huge. That's the takeaway from all of this. That if the criminal knew that others are there, to ch his odds would change, mm -hmm. which may keep him from going there. That's why gun-free zones are so dangerous and why we're working so hard to try to eliminate them if at all possible. And there are very powerful, well-funded forces trying to stop us from doing that. Yeah, it's, it's completely ridiculous. I, I tell people in my class that the... Mind is the weapon and everything else is a tool. So, you know, in my car, I mean, I usually carry two or three knives and a gun, but I have the leg of a bar stool, I have some, some knives, I have some tactical pens, and I have some aerosol hairspray and a big lighter. And anyone that knows, uh, anyone that was in Boy Scouts knows that's a, a homemade flamethrower. Sure. So, I've never done this. Even for 54-year-old guys, man, it's still a lot of fun to do that kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. I can still figure out fun stuff to do with firecrackers. You? Of course. <laughs> of course. So, you know, I've, I, I never want to push it, but I always tell people, I say, you know, if somebody ever, if I get pulled over and the cops says, do you have any weapons in the car? I'm like, oh, what are you looking for? Right. Like, help a brother out. Can you be a little more particular? 
because uh, of course I've got, you know, I can stick a pen through someone's eye and, and through their throat. And, and, and I don't know about you, but when I fly, I carry one of these guys. Mm -hmm. I get a Smith & Wesson tactical pen, use it like a Kubaton, uh, gets right through the metal detector, you throw it with your keys. I have a Kubaton that I take also. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, it's the mind of the weapon, everything else is the tool. Well, and you can do so many, there's so many different ways to teach self-defense to people, as you know. And, oh, yeah. And people who live in different areas can't use the same tools that you can use. For example, it might not be legal for you to do what I do in Georgia. And mm -hmm. In fact, I can promise you it's not legal it's for not. you to do a number of things <laughs> I can do in Georgia. Like firecrackers. <laughs> well, firecrackers <laughs> might be one, yeah. But, you know, as far as far as fires, yeah, it's, it's really sad because the people of Massachusetts and the people, I, as I told you yesterday, I graduated high school in Connecticut. I was only there for a couple of years. But formative years, you know, high school graduation. Yeah. And I remember being at friend's house in their backyard shooting the 22 into the woods in a neighborhood in Simsbury, Connecticut. <laughs> Cop came out of the woods. One of the neighbors called the cops. Came out, asked what we were doing, checked the rifle that we were shooting with, told yeah. us to be careful. This was in Connecticut, 1979. Oh <laughs> you know, okay, so it's not know, that long ago. It sounds so long. I hated saying 1979. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I just kind of dawned on it. Better than 1879, <laughs> right? But you know, it, it wasn't that long ago, and it's really amazing how things have changed. You try to do that in Connecticut now, and I'd be on the lead story of the drug. Oh report, my God! You know, absolutely. My family would be persecuted. I would be. I'd be arrested. Yeah. And you'd have a bunch of, you know, boneheaded, liberal, lunatic, progressive socialists, formerly known as Democrats, with their, you know, pulling their hair out. Oh, my God, what were they doing? What are the parents teaching their what, kids? Yeah. Where, where are the parents? Right. It was nuts. And we were teenagers at the time, so. Yeah, I, 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 I call, I listen to a NPR station occasionally. You know what? I only listen to the NPR station in Boston after... Uh, after something big happens in the gun world, right. after there's a shooting, after the president comes out, and I ended up talking to the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, one time, and I did this uh, in May of 2016, and they're talking about we need to end, you know, gun violence, and we need to get the illegal guns off the street, and you know, kids are getting guns and shooting each other and shooting themselves, blah right. blah blah. And it's not that it's not important, and I don't want to, you know, downplay any of that. But I called up and I, I waited 20 minutes online. Uh, and I said to the I said to the mayor of Boston, I'm like, if you guys are really concerned about kids learning gun safety, maybe you should just chalk it up and say, you know what, we're not going to teach the parents. The parents, if 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 a parent has a gun illegally, they're probably not going to keep it locked up. They probably don't know to keep, how to keep it locked up. Well, you know, let me stop here. There, Pinkus made a comment about that the other day on a program. He was on the Young Turks. On the Young Turks, right? Like if you saw that, yeah. And he said, "Look, if you're worried about your kids breaking into your gun safe, you have far bigger problems. It's a parenting. It's issue. a parenting issue. I love that. Okay? That's, That's a, a parenting point. issue, and you need to. You have other concerns way beyond this. Mm -hmm. You need to take some parenting classes. Look, right. This is really simple to process. Okay. We could we could get really deep in the weeds with this, but when I was a kid growing up. Guns were guns were everywhere. Gun control wasn't an issue like it is today because the media 24/7 wasn't driving this this un-American anti-gun agenda, right? Mm -hmm. There were more guns unlocked then than there are today. People are far safer with their firearms today. Oh, absolutely. But pe kids knew guns. They they were they learned they learned about firearms. They were taught. And I tell a story. And I think I told you yesterday about a neighbor of mine who said to me, you know, we we got to talking about guns as we often do because they know what I do for a living. Some of my neighbors know it's in their best interest that if we want to remain friends, they just don't talk to me about what I do for a living. <laughs> but uh, he asked me, we, we, the conversation turned to firearms, and I said, do you teach your kids, you know, the rules of gun safety? Are you Real gun safety, not gun control, but are you teaching your kids right. the, the rules of firearm safety? And he said to me, I, he says, I, I don't have, really have to worry about that because I don't have any guns in my house. And I said, no, no, you do have to worry about that because your kids play at my house and I've got dozens of guns at my house. Yeah. And they, they play at his house and her house and they have guns. Yeah. So these, it doesn't matter if the parent, if you have guns in your family. The biggest takeaway is kids are still curious about guns. So here, think about this. Now you've got an uneducated kid who's never been taught anything about guns and all of a sudden that neighborhood kid finds their dad's revolver Absolutely. and shows your son. What's the first thing your son's going to do? He's going to say, keep that out of my he face. He doesn't know anything about it. He's going to pick it up and play with it. But mm -hmm. since he's taught him about guns, he's going to know to stop, don't touch, leave the area, tell, tell an adult. adult. 
I go a step farther for crying out loud. If there's no adult there, call 911. Yeah. You will never get in trouble at home for saving somebody's <laughs> life as far as it's my house, you know? Absolutely. So that's that's what we need to keep doing is pushing. And I'm a big fan of Pincus's for that reason. It's the education. Oh, yeah, totally. we talk the politics, we throw that around because we have to. They're trying to take our freedoms from us. Mm -hmm. And if we don't answer that, they will succeed. Yeah. But in reality, this is about teaching people and educating people, hence the books. Mm -hmm. You know, lessons from armed America and lessons from unarmed America. I've only had one of my kid's friends say to me, hey, we know you're a gun guy. Do you have all your guns locked up? And I, when they, they dropped their son off at the, to play for a couple hours. And I said, well, of course all my guns are locked up. I'm an instructor. I, I, you know, my kids know about gun safety. And I've been doing it with my kids for a long time. And I said, the only, the only gun that's loaded is the one that's on my hip. Right. And they're like, you have a gun on your hip? I'm like, yeah, I just came from Walmart. Of course I have a gun on my hip. <laughs> <laughs> and then literally two hours. Here's the the, the rest of the story. Uh, three hours. Walmart. Two, you gotta have a gun on your head. That's of course. For sure. oh Doesn't matter gosh. what state you're in. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple hours later, she came to pick up her son. She came in, had a cup of coffee, started asking about the gun stuff. I said, Hey, you, you want to see how they work? I'll, I'll bring them out. And I showed them to her. I gave her a, a half hour lesson on how to load and you know a revolver and a semi auto. And, and I pulled out my AR. And about a year or so later, she and her husband took a class with me. Right. And then. After they got their licenses, I would get text. I love this. I get text messages from my friend. They're like, "Dude, Walmart has 22. Mm -hmm. Come on down and get some." <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, have you ever taken anybody to the range? Of course. That didn't like it when it was over. <laughs> okay. Have you ever taken anybody to the range? It's, God, that was awful. That sucked. I never want to do that again. I had a friend of mine. Um, very against the whole gun stuff. His wife is against it. I had her come down to take some pictures of me while I was doing some stuff for whatever my website and all that. And so he told me, he says, I know my wife's going to come down and go to the range with you. I don't want her touching any guns. I said, all right, not a problem. So we're down there. She's taking pictures. Everything goes fine. Well, wait, let me ask this question. That, that, what he said, he doesn't want her touching any guns? <laughs> right. Okay, well, that's probably a whole different conversation. Probably because she'll enjoy it. <laughs> okay, okay. So anyway, uh, another instructor came down with a student, and he had a, a pink LCP. Uh-huh. Uh, no, a purple LCP. And he, she's like, oh, my gosh, that's cute. It's purple. Can I try that? Sure, go right ahead. And he had a, a 1522, a Smith 1522 uh -huh. that was in the pink camouflage. And she's like, this, Great is, guns, this is pretty cute. Can I, can I try this? He's like, absolutely. So I got a bunch of pictures of her shooting, and I, I didn't send them to him. Right. But I, I, at 10.30 that night, I get a phone call from him. He's like, what did you do to my wife today? I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> He's like, what did you do to my wife? I'm like, she took pictures of me at the range. She told me she shot a gun. Uh, yeah, she, she shot three of them. <laughs> At her got, request, she, right. she, she, He's like, she how wanted did, to. How did you get her to shoot a gun? I told you, I told you, I, I told you, I didn't want her to shoot. I said, somebody else asked her. I didn't. <laughs> she said yes. Went through the safety stuff. She did some shooting. She had a great time. So yeah, you can remove the politics and have fun. You know? Yeah, but I've absolutely. never taken anyone uh, shooting that didn't have that didn't an have a good absolute time. blast. Oh my gosh. An absolute blast. And I believe me, I've taken some people that are so far left shooting, they you think they were going to fall off the California coast. Oh, my gosh. Okay, and uh, one of them is, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But, yeah, no one <clears throat> no one has ever said to me, my gosh, I got scared. I don't ever want to do that again. Right. It doesn't matter what their politics are. Shooting a firearm is exhilarating. It's fun. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. It's empowering. And more than anything else, it's enjoyable. It's it's absolutely good, clean fun. On on one of my classes, on, on my Utah class, I have a class at uh, the slide, you know, PowerPoint that introduces me and what I am and whatever my background. And then I have a picture of me with my kids shooting at different ages, you know, mm -hmm. and, and me with some buddies of mine. I'm like, you know what? It's just good, clean fun. It to is. me, that's what it is. It's it's uh, it's just a lot of good, clean fun. And I, I you know, you're teaching somebody a new hobby. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I've got pictures like that with my kids. Yeah, and, uh, of course. You know, my daughter, she's just not real into it. My son loves his guns. He's mm -hmm. got about three or four different guns. Cool. Yes, he has that M&P 22. He's got the Ruger. He's got a Ruger 22. And, nice. Uh, he's, he loves his firearms. And if you ask my kids from the time they were three on up, mm -hmm. why does daddy have shooting guns in the house? And they would say, to keep us safe. Nice. Because that's what we were teaching our kids, that guns aren't evil. Guns are good. Guns are righteous. Guns keep us safe. They keep us free. Mm -hmm. You know, they keep, you know, because my kids are all about to keep the bad man away. Exactly. Or, you know, they save us. They help us. What they do is, you know, look, a firearm is not a magic talisman. It's, some, it's not going to just ward off evil. 
But it is a great equalizer. It is. And the fact of the matter is that if somebody tries something bad and you do have a means to protect yourself, as I did, mm -hmm. you can stop that activity before it escalates and a life can be saved. It's that simple. So that's yeah. the education. That's what we need to keep talking to people about, educating them about. Absolutely. I, I told people that I was I was a gun instructor before I knew I was a gun instructor because I was the first uh, one of the first guys in my group of guys that started shooting. So I would I'd say, hey, listen, I got something new. I've tried this. It's a lot of fun. You should try it. Let's go. Get away from the wife and kids. So we'd go down to the range. And I'm like, all right, so there's these safety rules you have to follow. And I'm, I'm teaching you safety rules not because you need to learn them. I'm teaching them because I don't want you to shoot me. Mm -hmm. I'm a little selfish that way. And every one of them went down and had a great time. Well, that's called education. Absolutely. And that's how it works. And, and I, it, it's an honor to me when I take my friends out to the range and then they end up signing up for a class, whether it's me or somebody else, and then they get their license and say, hey, listen, uh, I got my license. Let's go down to the range. I want you to show me a couple things. Oh, are you going to join me on the air tonight for a little bit? I would love to. I'd be okay. honored to. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll have some fun. We'll have some fun talking about riding shotgun with Charlie. <laughs> I do love you, this. Do you educate people about what that means, riding shotgun? Do you ever have anybody um, ask you what the term riding shotgun I do. You know means? what? I have a little a Tell little a big intro. Western history buff. <laughs> I like that stuff. It's kind of neat. Uh, the, the intro that I have mm -hmm. is, a, is a funk tune that a friend of mine and I uh, put together. And I have a little voiceover. And I say, riding shotgun has been around since the cowboy times. It meant somebody that was riding in a vehicle next to the driver, and they usually had a shotgun in case they ran into bandits. Usually a stagecoach. Yeah. That was carrying people and their valuables and or a Wells Fargo stage that was carrying money between runs from iron ore as they were moving back and forth, like from Tombstone to Bisbee and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the passenger, you had the individual on the left side was pulling the reins, and the individual right. on the right side had a shotgun. and defended the, not successfully all the time, <laughs> it would defend the stagecoach and its its occupants and its and its bounty. That's mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, So the terminology is neat. It's kind of neat. Most people don't realize where that kind of stuff comes from. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of terminology from the gun, the gun culture that, that we have, like oh, going, yeah. going off half cocked. Right. Passing the buck. You ever heard that one? I did not know. Passing the buck. Yeah, I've heard a really cool interpretation of that. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but it's neat to think about. Back in the old days, single sixes, right? Six shooters. Mm -hmm. Always keep one of the chambers, one of the cylinders. Right, empty. five shooters right, or six shooters. On, right on the, keep it on the. On yep, the, uh, the hammer on the primer. hammer on the on the chamber. So what they would do is they would roll their bankroll up and they would stick their money into the cylinder. Mm -hmm. And in order to fire off a shot, they had to pass the buck. You see? <laughs> really? So I have no idea. That's just one of them. There, there are many of That's them. There, you can read about many of them. But I've heard that one a couple times. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So don't hold me to that, okay? I, I don't know how accurate that is, but right, it's just right. fun to talk. about. It is fun. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of terminology. Um, like I said, going off half cock, past the buck. I'm riding shotgun. I used to ride, I, I didn't even know I'll what I'll be a huckleberry. Yeah, exactly. I got two guns, one for each of you. <laughs> it's good stuff, man. It is. It's a blast. Yeah, good, clean fun. I'll tell you it's not good, clean fun. It's just friggin' traffic. Now, here we sit. Now, you see, we're sitting here waiting to get to the fair. You've never done this before. I've never done this. You have no idea... I How to drive <laughs> back and drop us off right there at the booth where the Patriot actually is. Right. So we're going to sit here forever, and this will be your longest riding shotgun with Charlie <laughs> ever recorded. Totally. I got some extra batteries, so it should be good. See, this is a fun fair because, as Lee has told me before in the past, it's bittersweet mm -hmm. for Minnesota residents. It gets very cold here, and the two weeks of the Minnesota State Fair, this draws hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Oh, so yeah. It's something else. But when the fairs, oh, they love the fair when it comes, but when it's over, they realize winter's it's coming. Cold. It's, it's <laughs> Yeah, when, when the fair is over, they realize that their summer is over, and right. in a few short weeks, it's going to be now they, below uh, something, double digits. <laughs> Lee was saying they have four seasons here. They have summer, they have pre-winter, winter, and post-winter. <laughs> pretty much. That's pretty much it. And I don't know if you've ever been here, and I think we discussed it last night, but I've seen 30 below zero here, and it's just absolutely <laughs> mind-boggling. It's crazy. Yeah, that's. I'm good. I am good. So we went and saw the Prince thing last night. What was that? First that Street. That was. Uh, yeah, First where Avenue. Purple Rain was Purple First Rain Avenue, was First Street, whatever. First right, Street. Streets, First Avenue, Street, Boulevard. One goes this whatever. way. One goes this way. Is that how that works? Like that. It's the inter of uh, intersection of walk <laughs> and don't walk. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was where uh, where Prince used to play and where they filmed. Um, Film Purple Rain, Purple Rain, which yeah. is pretty cool. And of course, you know, being I've been a musician for a long time. I'm obviously a huge Prince fan. And uh, so it was pretty cool to go see that. Pretty 
cool to check that out. If you buy it before, I had no idea what it was until yesterday. Now, see, you'd think this was a Minnesota Vikings game. I wish the cameras could turn <laughs> and people could see what this is. But there are thousands of people crossing the streets here. It's, it's insane. Going to and from the fair. It there really we are. Is because we're at the entrance of it right now. This is a fun show to do. It really is. Every year. I love this. This girl's showing us who's number one. I love that. <laughs> I think Ted Nugent calls that the one-fingered salute. Yeah, wh wh who did, where'd she do that? Did I miss that? Uh, she, she was one, There was a car that was a little too close to the oh, uh, okay. to the um, the walkway. I thought Midwesterners were nicer than that. She could be from out of town. She could be from New England. <laughs> she could be from Massachusetts. <laughs> she could be. Now, this guy's got it. Do you see this thing on a stick over here? Oh, my God. That's like a foot-long corn dog. Two-foot-long corn dog because he ate half of it and it's still a foot-long left. <laughs> This guy's got a little tray with three drinks in it. <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> hey, I watched a little bit of your riding shotgun with Charlie with uh, Reverend Ken Blanchard. He's not oh, he great. Isn't he a great guy? He he is a great guy. I I got to tell you, I was totally honored to do this. I had this idea to do riding shotgun a few months ago because I spend a lot of time driving. Then it's was, a great idea, by the way. And I think you stole something from Seinfeld with riding with goofy liberal comedians in cars with coffee or something like that. Isn't that what it originally was? Uh, but a great concept. i got to give you hats off because it really is a great it, idea. It, well, so of course, Seinfeld did the uh, uh, comedians in cars getting coffee. And then one of the late, late night guys. I was close. Yeah, it's close. <laughs> um, one of the late night guys does uh, carpool karaoke. Right. So I watched those and I'm like, that's pretty cool. I'm like, who could I get? I'm like, I, I could get someone to drive. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interview people while I drive around. I'm gonna call it riding shotgun because they're riding shotgun mm -hmm. with me, and and then I'm like, I can talk to gun guys. I know, you know, I'm friends with some some instructors at the Gun Owners Action League. Um, I've got obviously other other buddies of mine are gun instructors. I'm like, who could I talk to? I'm like, you know what? I could talk to Lee. Lee had a scary situation. Right. I could talk about that. And I'm like, I have all my stuff in a in a toolbox. Little plastic toolbox for seven bucks from, from Walmart, and I stick the cameras in there. And I'm like, I can go anywhere and do this. Yeah, it's a great idea. And then I'm like, I, I called Lee up. I'm like, hey, I want to do this show. I want to come out and visit you and your wife, and and do this. And he's like, you know what? If you come out at the end, I think I can get uh, Peter Johnson from Archway Defense, and and you can get Mark Walters. I'm like, are you kidding? He's yeah, like, no. Fun. So I'm like, cool, let's do this. And then I'm like, who else can I talk to? And I'm like, Ken Blanchard. I've been listening to Ken Blanchard for a long time. The black man with the a gun. He trademarked that. Isn't that great? I, uh, Isn't that wonderful? I told him, Ken is the great, he's one of my great, he's one of my best friends. He's the nicest guy in the world. He is an awesome guy. And uh, I, sent him, I sent him an email and said, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'd like to come down to DC, drive around, interview you in the car. He's like, hey, man. I noticed the whole time he was driving around, he was doing this the whole time. He's like, you know, D.C. is a crazy town, man. It's just got to watch out around here. I think he was worried about you driving around because you hadn't driven around the city before. Right. Um, so what, I'll tell you what's really cool is I sent him an email, and he got back to me two hours later. And I, I was talking to one of my friends, and I said, so I'm going down to D.C. to meet this guy to drive around and interview him. And she's like, do you know this guy? I'm like, well, I've been listening to his podcast for about four years. And she's like, have you met him before? I'm like, no. So you're going to go pick up a guy that's a stranger, and you're going to drive around. He's got guns, you know. I'm like, well, he can't have him in D.C. I can't have right. him in D.C. It's going to be what's fine. The what's yeah, the big deal? It was, it was a great episode, and you can't do anything with Ken that isn't a great episode. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's just awesome. so down to earth, and he's so real. He is. He is. I, we're I, gonna, we're gonna put, we'll put you on the air tonight. Here I can't me. wait, man. This is the fifth annual show that we've done here from these guys. I think I missed one for some I don't, somebody's schedule didn't work that year. Yeah. But uh, this is the fifth year we've done it. It's a lot of fun. The uh, the day that I got got to interview Ken, I stopped in northern New Jersey on the way down to oh, D.C. Oh, you poor soul. <laughs> I know. I you went from Massachusetts to northern New Jersey on your way to D.C. Yes. Dude, you need to get in free uh, America. You need to come <laughs> south of well, the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> come talk to us about down there where when you're dealing with people, when people are riding shotgun, they're they carrying riding sh they're shotgun. literally riding my, shotgun. My we can fix that for you. <laughs> my original game plan is my uh, my logo is a, a window, like a truck window, right. with a shotgun in it, and it says riding shotgun with Charlie. And I'm like, you know what would be really cool is if I actually got a truck and put some shotguns in the window. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like, that would be pretty cool. But, um, anyway, so, oh, man, I think we missed whatever we need. Um, I have absolutely no idea. Cool, me neither. Every time I come here, I drive or I get driven around, and I have no idea. Um, I ended up calling Anth uh, 
stopping at the Gun for Hire range in, right. in uh, Woodland Park in New Jersey. And I asked Anthony Calandro if he'd be up for doing this. And I said, and I said, hey, I'm, I, just, I wanted to meet him, you know, listen to his podcast too. And um, he said it was a cool idea. I said, I'm going down to see Ken. He's like, hey, tell the ref I said hi. And then the um, ref. The rev. So he's like, tell the rev I said hi. And um, I think this is where we want to be, to tell you the truth. Um, Anthony's like, you know what, here's my number. Call me back when you're coming back through Jersey. Uh, By the way, I want to point out to viewers who might be able to see behind us. We've been driving for blocks and blocks and blocks, <laughs> and the fair is still there. It's still, there. there's still thousands of people everywhere. It's really something. Yeah, we're in like a neighborhood now. You know, there's a couple people out here at the fair that make their annual salary for the two From weeks. this? From the oh, fair. I can totally. One of them is a cookie company. Really? They sell more cookies here in a two-week period. It's the only time they sell them, and they wow. sell them here for, for a two-week period and make a ton of money doing it. That's insane. People have great ideas, wonderful ideas. All right, you know what? Now, you, this we, is, we this get to, do you have a pass? We have a pass to go through there, right? We have a pass to go through here. Um, okay, good. Lead to let's, uh, let's do this. Let's pull over and close the show out, sure. and, and then we'll call Lee and figure out what's going on. Sounds good to me. All right, so we're going to pull over right here. We are right next to the Minnesota State Fair, and we're going to go hang out with... Uh, Lee Michaels and Peter Johnson and a bunch of other guys and we'll do some some cool stuff there. So Mark, it has been a pleasure, man. Thank, Thank you, man. Enjoyed much. it very much. Looking Thank forward you very to doing much. it again. This is this has been a lot of fun. Thank and we will you, catch sir. you guys next time on Writing Shotgun with Charlie. Please make sure you like my Facebook page, Writing with Shotgun with Charlie. Check out the YouTube channel. You can find it by looking for Writing Shotgun with Charlie. And soon I need a website up and going, and that's gonna be Writing Shotgun with Charlie. And I'll see you on the radio. Awesome, can't wait. <laughs>